this is very, very often the problem with houseplants bought from big box stores is that the substrate they are planted in is not ideal. They're planted in something that works well in the, in the big computer controlled climate of the nursery, but doesn't really work well in your house. <laughs> I just love the craziness of this yeah. one. It's a variegated and it's a monstro's form. And so you just get this amazing coloration. Now this has not been watered probably has been watered maybe once since October. I don't think I've ever spent more than £20 on a houseplant because I swap, if I want something rare, I will just swap for it. Hey! Hello and welcome to episode 78 of Talking Dirty over at East Ruston Old Vicarage, all bundled up on a chilly day in a very smart cable sweater. We have Alan Edward Herbert Gray, our happy and very handsome horticulturalist. And over in Cambridgeshire on this wonderful sunny day, and she's smiling just like the sun itself. We have Thordis Maria Sophia Fredrickson. Today, I've decided to model myself after one of those rhubarb and custard sweets. That's the that's the <laughs> tone that I've got going on on my check shirt. And joining us on the other side of the country, we are delighted to welcome back award-winning garden writer, organic gardener, and generally fantastic plants woman and person, Val Iris Bourne. Welcome back. Thank you very much for inviting me. <laughs> I mean, I can tell Alan that it is also sunny in the wonderfully named village of Cold Aston, <laughs> high in the top 12. <laughs> <laughs> Has it been very chilly and very cold in cold It's been very windy. And this morning we had to take all our nets off the brassicas because obviously they would have been down in Borton on the water if we'd left them. And we grow a lot of our own vegetables. So we took the nets off the curly kale and the cavolo nero and the savoy cabbages. And um, we had a rude awakening this morning because when I pulled back the curtains, it was about seven o'clock, there were pigeons <gasps> on the purple sprouting. Oh, wow. So... I made the best beloved get up very quickly and put the nets on. What a way to start the day. <laughs> he wasn't impressed. <laughs> now, we got to the chance to see you not that long ago at Alan's wonderful snowdrop day where you regaled us with a very interesting talk. And I'm sure managed to buy one or two things. Dare I ask what you picked up? I bought up? some snowdrops. I cannot quite tell you which ones I bought, but Brian Ellis, I know, sold me several snowdrops. <laughs> Um, Which I'm... end of the table, Val? Because Brian had organised his from least expensive to most expensive. Well, I don't think it was a mega. I didn't buy anything mega expensive. And I bought some snowdrops from the lovely Brenda Foster, who um, sadly has just been widowed and her yeah. garden, Gable House, um, uh, fair. I think it's Suffolk. I'm not very good on these. It's, it's, it's Reddisham near Beckles. Oh, is that Suffolk or Norfolk? That's Suffolk, yeah. Suffolk, yes. It was going to be open the next Sunday when, of course, we had all the stormy weather. But I would uh, encourage people to go to Gable House if they're on the eastern side of the country to see Brenda's snowdrops. And she always wears a snowdrop hat. I've got several pictures of her. <laughs> you know what else they've got there? Her late husband, John. I mean, John was such a lovely man. He was a great help to me when we first started organising plant fairs and that sort of thing. Um, and um, they had some lovely sort of fairly young fruit trees, but the fruit trees were festooned with mistletoe and they had actually yeah. planted the seed of the mistletoe on those trees themselves. Yeah. And I think, you know, to anybody to go there, I mean, ask Brenda about it because lots of people today are growing fruit trees and there is a knack to actually getting the mistletoe started. Um, and, you know, we all want to do that sort of thing. So, Go and have a look and ask Brenda and she'll tell you how. We can't do that on top of the Cotswolds. It, it's only when we descend into the valleys that we see yeah. the But John Foster was a very interesting man because he had a shop, um, um, I think in Ravenham, but that way anyway. And Paul and, and Lady Priscilla Bacon used to bring snowdrops into the shop to sell. And that's how he got into snowdrops. But previously, he was a bowls boy. So he was one of the boys that went to the club that Edward Augustus Bowles ran. So he had been around plants since he was quite, since his very early teenager. And he was a lovely man and he's very sadly missed. But he's one of those people who died suddenly, been to a plant fair and, you know, it's the way all gardeners want to go, I think. It certainly is. And I remember Gardening reading... Day. I remember reading E.A. Bowles' book, Gussie, as he was known. Yes. Um, and he frequently, he'd be 
out somewhere, probably having supper with somebody or something like that. First thing he used to do when he got home was go and look at the bulb frames. And one of the things, one of the plants that he grew from seed quite a lot was crocus, as you know. Yes. Um, And he was often told off by his manservant for having knelt in the mud um, (laughs) near the (laughs) the bulb frame rather than take something so that his his trousers didn't get dirty. He's probably checking that nobody had stolen anything. (laughs) Bowles was one of the very first people not to label his snowdrops. He gave them numbers, apparently so that people didn't know what they were. And I've got a little crocus called Bobbo, um, which is a Tommy, I believe. And I bought it from the garden and Bobbo was one of the Bowles boys. Oh. So, you know, the whole of this gardening thing is steeped in history, isn't it? It I mean, is, but, and people. And people, <laughs> for those that are interested too. I mean, Middleton House, I think that it, the, the garden where EA Bowles lived, I think is now open to the public. Um, well, it's owned by the local authority, and all yes. you have to do is pay for the car park and go in. Yeah, it's and I mean, really... it'd be lovely to just sort of have a look, and and you know, and also, of course, they have a good snowdrop day there fairly early in the year, so you could yeah. kill two birds with one stone, or two hundred pounds, or something. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was two hundred pounds. <laughs> <laughs> it's the last Saturday in January. They have um, the first, one of the very first snowdrop sales. And Joe Sharman, Mr. Snowdrop goes. Um, lots of people uh, sell there, and uh, it's a very good place to buy snowdrops if you've got deep pockets. <laughs> well, we're talking about deep pockets, Val. The latest snowdrop to to <laughs> to be sold is um, Golden Tear. I think I remember. I mean, yeah. I remember when Green Tear was the snowdrop that took everybody's yes. um, breath away, and I bought a couple of Green Tear secretly on the internet because I didn't want to tell the husband. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, we're all like that. (laughs) But I mean, now Golden Tear has appeared and Golden Tear is what? 1850 it went for. There you are. Well, it's going up. It shows no signs Uh, of 55 bids and I think uh, either 14 or 15 bidders bidding for it. And we all wonder who bought it, but we don't know. (laughs) Do you think it's an amazing snowdrop? Do you think they'll be um, chipping it, Val, the person who bought it? Well, this is what I surmised in an article I wrote uh, for the online Telegraph. Is it a keen gardener who's trying to enjoy it ahead of the pack, possibly because you're in advanced years like me and you think, how long have I got? (laughs) I'll buy it while I can see it, that sort of thing. (laughs) Or is it somebody who is going to wait until June and July and then get the scalpel out? I rather hope it's a keen gardener but I rather suspect it'll be someone cutting it up a little later but it's a lot of work breeding a snowdrop if you added up all Joe's hours he'd be on less than the minimum wage yeah exactly you know it's a lot of work I think the thing about cutting up snowdrops is you you mustn't overcut them don't be greedy because if you're greedy um the embryonic bulbs that are produced from your slivers that you cut um, are going to be too weak and they they could easily revert. Yes. And I was at, at uh, John Morley's snowdrop day a few weeks ago and he actually showed me uh, a pan of snowdrops and it was one of the trim type snowdrops yes. you know, with the little kick out yeah. petals yeah. and the, the dabs of green on the outside. A pixie hat. Um, <laughs> yes, pixie hats. <laughs> yep. Um, and there, there was a couple of bulbs from this, from this, Hatched hatchery, if you like. They were all, all the chippings were in this one pan, and there were yes. two of them reverted to ordinary snowdrops. Yeah, they do um, revert. So that's what you get when you yes. do. Yes, and you yeah. yeah. I don't know how many. So whoever you are, if you're listening to us, please don't be greedy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't got the time. When it comes to June and July, uh, you know, I grow all my own veg and all my own tomatoes, and I've got greenhouses to water, red currant jelly to make. I have no time. Yeah, exactly. Slicing up. No, you haven't. I quite agree. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd love to, but I, I mean, when I stop writing, when, when that golden day comes, when I think, actually, I can't do this. Please anymore. don't stop writing, Val, because <laughs> everything you write is peppered with anecdotes and lovely little stories, um, and we enjoy reading you, so I'm going to put in a plea, please don't stop writing. <laughs> That's what everybody says, but uh, I don't know. Good, well, they will. Forever. There's your popularity. <laughs> 
Yes, thank you very much. That's very kind. <laughs> Not at all. It's well deserved. Yes. Oh, and can you. I ask Val of your snowdrops this year, which you've been most pleased with, which have been performing well? Well, I, I always say the same one. So it's very boring because I have one called, um, oh gosh, what is it called? Green Heart, I think. Green of Hearts? Green of Hearts, thank you. And it's coming up in the middle of a maiden hair fern that keeps its foliage. And it's probably got 50 flowers on it. I, should, I can't dig it up, obviously, because I'd have to dig the maiden hair fern up. Maiden hair fern is getting wider, I'm getting more and more snowdrops. And it is a snowdrop with poise. It's also slightly out of the wind, which helps in this garden. And, you know, it's just got this lovely sort of open, I call them pixie cat, pixie hats. I'm not getting into rugi form or inverse <laughs> popular form arguments. And it has this heart shaped green mark. And with the, um, you know, fur, with the maidenhair fern, which keeps its colour fairly well in reasonable winters, it's just, it's just like a posy. It's lovely. But I love I love all my snowdrops. I've got a snowdrop uh, visitor this afternoon, and I can hardly wait <laughs> to go round. It was actually lovely on Alan Snowdrop Day. It's it's great to see them all laid out on the tables for sale. But there's nothing quite like seeing them in a nice clump in the I garden. And have a confession. Oh, I did not go round the garden <laughs> because when you're doing a talk, you have to engage brain. Yeah. So if I had gone around the garden, people would have asked me questions and they would have talked to me. And then I, I would start my talk. I've done this before. I start my talk on a note of exhaustion. So I'm, I, I actually um, sat down, had a cup of tea, um, looked at the snowdrops, bought some snowdrops, took myself off to a quiet place. So I didn't get round the garden. Well, next year you've got to, because there are so many now, Alan, and they're all... I might uh... never be invited again. <laughs> So I have break to, I in have... Val. <laughs> <laughs> but they're, well, no, they're, I thoroughly they're enjoyed labeled. it. Mm, <laughs> and yeah, it's, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's nice to see them actually sort of in the garden situation yes. and clumping up and, and looking I mean, lovely. My husband is very unkind about my snowdrops. A, he says they're all the same. And then B, he says they are the national collection of white labels. But if I put black labels in, I fall on them in the summer and snap them off. And I've got so many in my garden and I've quite a lot of similar ones that I don't want to lose track of what's what. So there you are. <laughs> That's a good point, Val, because um, I know several people that have got named varieties of snowdrops in their garden and they, over the years, the labels have got lost. I mean, you have to renew them every year, I find. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I mean, uh, over the years, the labels have got lost and because they've got no idea what they've got and what they are, what they're called. No. And sometimes it's impossible to, to, to actually, um, unless you're an absolute expert, to, to name them again. Yes. Well, um, I'm, I'm on the side of leaving the seed heads on to get interesting seedlings. And I've got some very interesting seedlings here. So I don't deadhead mine. And I don't mind if there's a little bit of muddling in the clumps, but I do want to know vaguely what's what. So I, I plant my close together so that the pollen and the bees can fly. You know, we don't get, yeah. we haven't had many bees this year because it's been so dull and cool here. But that's the way all these interesting snowdrops pop up. Most people don't breed snowdrops. Joe Sharman is the exception. He gets his paintbrush out and deliberately crosses things. And that's why I admire Joe Sharman so much. Yeah. I am very excited. I haven't quite got as many different, because um, I have finally succumbed. I now have some snowdrops. It happened. Uh, this was the final <laughs> snowdrop event where I could resist. And I didn't quite get all the different kind of characteristics I could, but I tried to get a few different ones so that hopefully yes. in time I'll get some seedlings. So well, there are two magic snowdrops that are very, very good at producing seedlings. When I say producing seedlings, their pollen is very fertile. The first one is trim because trim was a snowdrop found in the 1990s in Westbury on trim, and it's quite slow to bulk up for me, but the pollen produces so many different seedlings. So the best one is trumps, which was found in John Morley's garden, because that's so easy to grow, but there's trumpaloop, there's trism, there's trim baby, there's trimmer. And the other one is actually this uh, yellow snowdrop here. It's a changeling. It's what's called a changeling snowdrop. Let me see if I can hold it still. 
Um, so it has elements of green and yellow in it, and it's called chameleon because it's a changeling. There's lots of changelings like that. Um, Midas is one. But this chameleon, which was uh, named by a man called Richard Bashford, who gardens in Northamptonshire, and he sells snowdrops, RB snowdrops, all sold out more or less now, but good one to remember. He produced this chameleon, and it's chameleon, and Wendy's gold is actually quite good as well, that produces the yellow element in seedlings. So, um, you know, what you need to do is get your green ones and then pop some of these yellow ones, like Wendy's gold and chameleon amongst them, and then wait for 10 years. <laughs> I don't know whether I've got 10 years, but. <laughs> Why didn't we have this conversation before I went to the Snowdrop event, though I suspect I would have spent quite a lot more money if we had, so probably best that I didn't. Well, Wendy's gold is cheap to get. Inexpensive, Alan would correct you. Yes, well, I'd say cheap, cheap as chips. And <laughs> I've got more Jamie Oliver in me than Alan. <laughs> <laughs> oh well I'm I'm so pleased I know you hate picking plants from the garden Val I'm so pleased uh -huh. that you managed to pick a snowdrop for us I've We've managed to pick quite a few things have you we've embarked yes. upon show and tell and show and tell from your garden is always a real inspiration what what are you going to show us next Ooh. well I'm going to show you this stripping on my computer and it's called Vanguard and it's not fully out it's a large crocus it's got silver and purple flowers when it's fully out. And it's called Vanguard because it is two weeks earlier than all the other large Dutch crocuses. And the reason it is two weeks earlier than the large Dutch, other large Dutch crocuses is it was uh, collected by Van Chibergen in Russia. And the further east you go in the world, the later things flower. So when you collect a sanguisorba in China, say, put it in an English garden, it often flowers in September, October. So it's got the Eastern provenance and it's called Vanguard. It used to have a much more complicated name when Bowles wrote his handbook of um, crocuses. It had a much more complicated name, but it was then named Vanguard. And when I started growing crocuses, I grew Vanguard, but it was not available in any of the big catalogues. And I kept writing about it. And now I'm very pleased to say it is very available and it's a real goodie. And um, I also grow another very similar one called Yalta. Yalta is my absolute favourite. I absolutely I adore Yalta. I just love the colour of it. I throw it through a very early lime green spurge and the Lovely. two look fantastic together. Well, Vanguard has a very similar colouring and uh, Yalta came from seed from the Botanic Garden at Yalta and it was sent to a man called Yanis Ruxans, who is a Latvian bulb grower and um, he grew it on and he noticed it was different from all the other Thomasinianus because it's obviously a hybrid and who knows, perhaps... Vanguard was implicated in it. I don't know. But it's a wonderful thing. And I live with a botanist. And one of the things I love doing is upsetting him by saying things like, that crocus has a wonderful orange feather duster in the middle. <laughs> it's very upset by comments like that. But it does, doesn't it, Alan? It's yes, a it really does. bright, feathery <laughs> stigma and style. Yeah. I don't know which, which, which. So. <laughs> well, it could be either, but I, let's say stigma. Yes. It sounds more botanizing. Yes, yes. I love upsetting my botanist husband. <laughs> Good fun. You've started strong with a couple of fantastic crocuses, including Alan's favourite. So strong start, well, Val. This is the little primula, which John Fielding raised. Uh, and I think it has Juliana Brod, but don't quote me. And it's called Barbara Midwinter. Oh. Yep. And you can see why it's called Barbara Midwinter, because it flowers from about November right the way through. And I think it's an absolutely lovely little primrose, a little burst of colour. Um, you need to put it somewhere where it won't dry out in summer. Uh, this is actually growing in a crevice in the, in the uh, paved area in front of our cottage. It, it arrived as a seedling. Uh, but Barbara Midwinter is a lovely little uh, primula uh, that will flower in winter. And I'm going to go on. Shall I go on? Yeah. Yes. yes. Um, this is... Uh, um, it's a form of Iris unguicularis called Abingdon Green. Abing, I think it's Abington. Abington Purple. I'm sorry, I'm getting my snowdrops and my irises muddled. 
Abington Purple. And this is the in a very south-facing position in the garden against the house wall, uh, which is what you need to do with these winter flowering irises, which are iris unguicularis, because they were collected in places like Algeria and Morocco. I do have some other parts of the garden, but if you want the November to March flowers, you have to put it in a warm, very sunny place, sunny position, and you need to tidy the foliage up in autumn. And this is, has flowered since November. It's probably got about 20 flowers on it now. Now, if you pick a bud of ordinary un Iris unguicularis, it will unfurl in water while you have your cup of tea, which I think is so Harry Potter. But this <laughs> one doesn't do it, but it is the best flowering one we have. I go a silver one called Water Butt. I grow a blue one called Mary Bernard. But this uh, Abington purple um, is absolutely uh, the best flowering one, but I think it's probably the position. So I love those winter irises, even though, you know, you have to give them a good tidy. Do you think the re... Because they don't seem to be as... Well, they're, they're available, but they're not as popular as some, you know, like an iris reticulata. Everybody has iris reticulata. I mean, around my area where hardly anyone gardens, you will see some iris reticulata, yes. which is, is lovely. But is it just that they're... They're fussier. Is that why? Well, I, no, I don't think it's that. I think we ha now have um, a sort of thing about buying plants when they're in flower. So we go to the garden centre and it's very annoying as a gardener because you can't buy a phlox until it flowers in August. <laughs> and then you've got the devil's job to keep it going and get it going. Whereas if you could buy it in April. But, you know, we have this thing in garden centres that gardeners are so moronic it has to be in flower so they know what it is it's rubbish and this poor thing doesn't look good in a pot it flowers in November spasmodically and then gets going and really you need to plant this in spring and get it from someone like Avon Bulbs um, or the, gardens. the nursery and get it planted and keep it watered so that you get those flowers it's it, it, it's never going to be sold because it flowers at the back end of the year and finishes about March and yeah. garden centres very rarely have them. They're all like Christmas on. trees. But you see, that's the, I think the lack of popularity of some of those winter flowering plants is because we, well, let's go back to the autumn when people say, I'm going to put my garden to bed to the winter. Yes. That's the reason, because they don't think that they don't go out into the garden during yeah. the winter. That makes so me I've been, deep. I've been going into my um, my sunk garden and we've got some raised beds and all the raised beds that face south have got iris unguicularis yes. varieties or iris lazica um yes. in them and the, and i mean the, the, it's a delight to go in every morning and just look at how many I flowers know. we've got I mean, today i had a uh, lady beatrix stanley which yeah is a hysteroides um selection that was in flower at christmas and it's still showing that lovely sort of cobalt blue now and um, they do persist really well in my garden. And actual fact, that is one of the best hysteroides irises for repeating yes. and, and bulking up and carrying on. And there are hybrids um, with hysteroides bud, like Catherine's Gold. Yeah. Um, that's very persistent. Um, and then you've got the three smoky blue ones, Sheila and Germany, Frank Elder and Catherine Hodgkin. And Catherine Hodgkin is very strong. It comes back a long long you know year after year i have to say that we've got about five clumps in the thelictron garden of catherine Hob catherine hodgkin, hodgkin. They've after elliot hodgkin's uh, wife by bertram yeah. anderson who grew it as a seedling and elliot hodgkin was a botanist but we'll forgive yeah. him <laughs> we'll forgive them for that but um <laughs> my hodgkin clumps are so voluminous they're almost yes. obscene and it's such a good plant. I mean, it must be divided regularly, I think, to yes. just keep looking comely because they look rather overburdened with flowers at the moment. Yes. Well, nothing's voluminous in my garden or voluptuous, <laughs> apart from me, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I like this little cardamony. Um, oh, yes. Quinquifolia. It's one of those plants that's flowering now and it's a spreader. So if you uh, have an aversion to things that sort of take you over a bit, don't grow it. <laughs> but I love it. And, it. and it's made spreads of about two to three metres. And I don't mind because by the time April, May comes, it's gone underground. And people will come to my garden and they'll say, I love a bit of that. So I get the spade out and I dig it. And you can't get to the root. 
I don't know how nurserymen propagate it. They must do it from pots. So I can never dig any up for some people, but I think it's, it's, a, it's one of the sort of ladies' smock family. And, uh, you know, it's got the four petals. It's a brassica. It's attractive to bees. I just like it. You know, it's, it's there and it's just a bit of interest before all the things like the sillas come up, you know, just a bit of colour. It's absolutely beautiful. I don't know why I don't have that right. The Flomo list is increasing, Val. <laughs> yes. Uh, and this is uh, a snowdrop that's looking very good at the moment. I don't know whether you can spot the yep. two eyes at the top. And it's uh, a Rod Martin Arcturus. And this was named by Simon Bidolf, who um, is part of the Bidolf family who own Rod Martin Manor, which is between Sirencester and Tetbury. Very good snowdrop garden to visit in the past. I haven't been for, for a bit because of COVID. Um, but um, this is uh, um, a wonderful snowdrop because it's so substantial and it's quite short. So it makes a nice wide clump and it has this wonderful form on the petals. It's got definitely got El Wesi eye blood in it. Um, and he names several after stars. So there's Regulus, Arcturus, Sirius. Uh, they're all good, but this is, I think, the star of the show, Arcturus. It's one of my favourites. And I'm, I'm, I don't like picking my snowdrops, as you know, but I did pick that one because I thought uh, that's one of the ones that's not mega expensive. And it's a really, really good snowdrop. I, I feel like we'll open a whole, uh, it's like a whole separate podcast. But when we did our snowdrop special last year, I'm not sure we spent too much time kind of briefly going El Wesi, Gracilis, different types of snowdrops. Yeah. Is there like an easy? Yeah, there is an easy way. Um, Nivalis has grass-like leaves, quite small flowers, short stature normally, uh, flowers mid-February time. Um, plicates, now plicate means pleated, and it, they're wide green leaves with a central midrib that's pale and a little tuck that goes in. I would like, if I'd have been a botanist, I'd have called it Galanthus Pintuckii, but I don't, <laughs> think, I don't think the best beloved would like that. <laughs> plicate means pleated, and it's very easy to tell a plicate snowdrop because of the foliage. The flowers are right round and they have a seersucker texture on the petals. Uh, my favourite are Augustus and um, Amy Doncaster, which has green tips. And then you get the Elwesi eyes, which have grey foliage, which is upright, blunt tip. And when you have a grey plant in your garden, you think sun, don't you? But snowdrop, they're always sold as a woodland plant and they're not. Nivalis is a woodland plant. Plicate actually grows better in a more open, damp situation. It, it's quite often in meadows. There's a colony up on the top of Wandlebury Ring, for instance. But the grey-leaved Elwesi eyes, um, they, they'll grow quite happily under roses and in sunnier spots. And they're all the way up my garden. And they're big, bold snowdrops. So when people come, those are the ones they're attracted to. And then you get all the others, like Gracilis, with its curly leaf. That needs a hot spot. But it's mainly three species, Nivalis, Plicatus and Elwesii, that have hybridised in the wild where they overlap and in gardens that have given us all these interesting hybrids. And hybrids have hybrid vigour. So if you fail with Nivalis, you need to find a hybrid. And I suspect this has, Arcturus has hybrid vigour because it's such a strong snowdrop. That's the lecture over with. I'm so glad <laughs> I asked that question. Well, I don't know that you are. No, I genuinely am. <laughs> Always look at the foliage. If it's grey, put it in a sunny spot. Hey. Oh no, I've gone something wrong. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what I've done. Hang on, I'm, I'm nearly there. <laughs> Hello! 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 <laughs> Hello! Hello, Fordus! Oh, Hello! Oh. This is a label for chameleon. I don't know whether I'm holding it in the right place. Up, 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 up. There yes, we go. Up, up, up. See you after the podcast. Yeah, brilliant. Oh, right. Well, Alan's blown his nose, so I think we're ready to start. <laughs> yeah, I think I might have a quick wipe. I've just been galloping around the garden picking stuff. 